The murmur of atrioseptal defect is a systolic flow murmur across the pulmonic valve coupled with a fixed, split, second heart sound. Listen to a patient with an atrial septal defect. I will begin with three normal beats and then add the split second heart sound and finally the systolic murmur. The murmur and the fixed splitting of the second heart sound are usually heard best at the second left intercostal space with the patient sitting up. The opening between the atria that allows left to right shunning is acoustically silent. However, the increased flow across the pulmonic valve produces a grade 2 to 3 systolic murmur. Transesophageal echocardiography with color Doppler allows visualization of the shunt across the septal defect. The fixed splitting of the second heart sound is caused by prolongation of right ventricular ejection. This results in a pulmonic closing sound, which is noticeably later than the aortic closing sound. Patients with a left to right shunt greater than 1.5 to 1 are at risk of developing right heart failure and should have their defect closed. Percutaneous closure of the defect is now possible in selected patients with secundum defects. Those patients who have their atrial septal defect closed by age 25 have a normal life expectancy. In summary, atrial septal defect is a common congenital lesion. The flow murmur across the pulmonic valve and a fixed, split, second heart sound are key findings in this diagnosis.
The murmur of a ventricular septal defect is holosystolic and often accompanied by a palpable thrill. Listen to a patient with a ventricular septal defect. I will start with three beats and then add the murmur. This murmur is usually heard best to the left of the sternum in the fourth or fifth intercostal space. It is due to the pressure gradient between the high pressure left ventricle and the low pressure right ventricle during systole. The intensity of this murmur does not correlate with the degree of shunting. In fact, a small restrictive ventricular septal defect, as shown here, can produce a grade 5 murmur, while a large unrestricted ventricular septal defect may have no gradient at all between the ventricles and hence no murmur is generated. Patients with a ventricular septal defect tend to be diagnosed early in life. This is because small ventricular septal defects produce a loud murmur and large ventricular septal defects precipitate heart failure at a young age. The murmur of ventricular septal defect responds dynamically to changes in afterload. For example, a hand grip maneuver will noticeably increase this murmur. Listen to the change in the murmur of ventricular septal defect with a hand grip maneuver. First at rest, and now with hand grip. Ventricular septal defect is the second most common congenital heart lesion after bicuspid aortic valve, accounting for approximately 25% of congenital defects. Most small ventricular septal defects will undergo spontaneous closure in the first few years of life. Many ventricular septal defects can now be closed with catheter techniques. Surgery may still be required to close large ventricular septal defects to prevent heart failure or the occurrence of pulmonary hypertension. Two-dimensional echo Doppler imaging can identify the defect in the septum and help guide interventions to close it. In summary, the holosystolic murmur of ventricular septal defect is heard at the fourth or fifth left intercostal space and is often accompanied by a palpable thrill. Listen once again to a patient with a ventricular septal defect. 
Mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular disease in the United States, occurring in 2.4% of the population. Listen to a mid-systolic click and late-systolic murmur of mitral valve prolapse. I will start with three normal beats, and then add the click, and finally the murmur. The click and the murmur are usually heard best at the cardiac apex, but the click may be heard throughout the precordium. Current echo criteria include one or two mitral leaflets displaced at least two millimeters beyond the mitral annulus. The click and murmur are affected by dynamic maneuvers such as squatting. Moving from the standing to the squatting position causes the click and murmur to move later in systole. Listen to the change in the click murmur with a squat maneuver. Standing. Squatting. In a classic study, researchers demonstrated that the click always occurs at the same ventricular diameter. Maneuvers like squatting that increase left ventricular size cause the click to move later in systole. Listen once again to the change in the click murmur with a squat maneuver. Standing. Squatting. The underlying pathology of mitral valve prolapse is myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve. This leads to elongation of the valve structures and, on occasion, to chordal rupture. In some patients, there is only a mid-systolic click and no murmur. When the click is present, it responds to squat maneuver in the expected fashion. Listen to a patient with only a mid-systolic click. Most patients with mitral valve prolapse can have successful mitral valve repair when their regurgitation progresses to the point of heart failure. In summary, mitral valve prolapse is the most common valvular disease in the United States. The click murmur complex moves later with a squat maneuver. Listen once again to a patient with mitral valve prolapse. 
Inflammation of the pericardial sac may produce a friction rub. These sounds are high-pitched and scratchy, often containing both a systolic and diastolic component. Listen to a two-component pericardial friction rub. I will start with three normal beats and then add the rub. Pericardial friction rubs occur when inflamed, visceral, and parietal pericardial surfaces rub against each other during three phases of the cardiac cycle, namely during atrial contraction, during ventricular systole, and during early diastolic filling. Listen once again to a two-component friction rub. Friction rubs are often heard best with the patient sitting up and leaning forward. Common causes of pericardial friction rubs include viral pericarditis, disseminated lupus, and uremic pericarditis. Listen to a patient with a two-component friction rub. The typical friction rub has two components, but three-component rubs may also be heard especially in uremic pericarditis. Listen to a three-component friction rub. I will start with three normal beats and then add the rub. Pulmonic ejection murmurs can have a scratchy quality and are sometimes misinterpreted as a friction rub. However, a scratchy sound should not be considered a friction rub unless both a systolic and diastolic component are heard. Listen once again to a two-component friction rub. Some clinicians believe that pericardial friction rubs are not heard when there is significant fluid in the pericardial sac. However, this is not true since some contact between the visceral and parietal pericardial surfaces is still possible despite large collections of fluid, as shown here. Listen to a two-component friction rub. Transient pericardial rubs occur in acute myocardial infarction, but they are usually localized to the area of inflamed myocardium. These rubs may last only a few hours. In summary, Pericardial friction rubs occur as a result of contact between inflamed pericardial surfaces. These sounds usually have two components and reflect motion of the heart relative to the pericardial sac. Listen once again to a two-component pericardial friction rub. 
The murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a harsh systolic murmur as shown in this phonocardiogram. Listen to a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I will begin with three normal beats and then add the murmur. This murmur is often loudest at the fourth left intercostal space, but radiates widely across the precordium. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a common genetic cardiac disease occurring in 1 in 500 adults in the United States. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by an abnormally thickened septum, although there can be hypertrophy in the midventricle or even the apex. The obstruction to left ventricular outflow occurs between the thickened septum and the mitral valve, as shown here. The murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy responds predictably to changes in afterload. With hand grip, there is a decrease in the murmur due to decreased obstruction across the left ventricular outflow tract. Listen to the change in the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a hand grip maneuver. I will begin with the patient in the resting position. Hand grip. The majority of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are asymptomatic, and population-based studies have shown a normal life expectancy for the group as a whole. Listen once again to the change in the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a hand grip maneuver. Hand grip. Despite the good prognosis for most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there are subgroups at increased risk of sudden death. In young athletes, for instance, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy continues to be the most common cause of sudden death. When needed, there are a variety of treatments available for symptomatic patients, including pharmacologic therapy, dual chamber pacing, alcohol ablation, and surgical myectomy of the ventricular septum, as shown here. In summary, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a common genetic cardiac disease, with most patients having a normal life expectancy. The murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy decreases with a hand grip maneuver. Listen once again to a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy.
In bicuspid aortic valve, the deformed valve produces a high-pitched ejection click shortly after the first heart sound, as shown in this phonocardiogram. Listen to a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. I will start with three normal beats and then add the ejection click. This ejection click is widely transmitted across the precordium and is often heard loudest at the cardiac apex as shown here. A bicuspid valve often produces a doming of the aortic leaflets in systole, which can be readily seen by transesophageal echo. The presence of an ejection click should prompt an evaluation for aortic valve disease. Ejection clicks occur across the entire spectrum of aortic stenosis, from mild to severe. When the aortic valve becomes severely calcified, as shown here, decreased movement of the leaflets prevents the click from occurring. It can be challenging to hear a click buried in the start of an aortic stenosis murmur. Listen to the click and murmur of mild aortic stenosis. I will start with three normal beats and then add the click and finally the murmur. Bicuspid aortic valves can be readily visualized by cardiac CT scans, as shown here. Patients with bicuspid aortic valves have an increased incidence of aortic regurgitation. Listen to a patient with a bicuspid valve and aortic regurgitation. I will start with three normal beats and then add the click and finally the diastolic murmur. New percutaneous methods of aortic valve replacement have shown promising results with acceptable risks. Listen once again to a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve and aortic stenosis. In summary, bicuspid aortic valves can produce an ejection click. This sound is high-pitched, radiates widely, and does not vary with respiration. Listen once again to a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. 
This pansystolic murmur, which is heard at the lower left sternal edge and increases on inspiration, is typical of tricuspid regurgitation. Listen to a patient with tricuspid regurgitation. I will start with three normal beats and then add the murmur. This murmur is heard at the lower left sternal border. As with most right-sided lesions, this murmur increases during inspiration. Notice the respiratory variation of this murmur. Tricuspid regurgitation can be due to dilatation of the tricuspid annulus or to intrinsic disease of the valve, such as endocarditis, as shown here. When this murmur occurs in an adult with right H enlargement, or a right bundle branch block, it suggests the presence of Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve. In this case, the tricuspid valve is displaced downward into the right ventricle, as shown here. A majority of patients with Epstein's anomaly have some type of atrial communication between the right and left atrium, which may cause cyanosis. Cardiac decompensation may develop with the onset of atrial fibrillation in these patients. Both third and fourth heart sounds may occur in tricuspid regurgitation. Listen to the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation accompanied by a fourth heart sound. I will begin with normal heart sounds and then add the fourth heart sound and finally the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. Patients with tricuspid regurgitation and severe symptoms, despite medical therapy, are candidates for corrective surgery, including tricuspid valve repair or replacement. If valve replacement is required, bioprostheses are preferred because of a high rate of thromboembolic complications with mechanical valves in the tricuspid position. Listen once again to the pansystolic murmur of tricuspid regurgitation accompanied by a fourth heart sound.
Echo Doppler studies can visualize the displaced tricuspid valve as well as the tricuspid regurgitation. Listen once again to the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation and note the increase with inspiration. In summary, patients with tricuspid regurgitation may present with a pansystolic murmur at the lower left sternal border that increases with inspiration. Listen once again to the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. Review session. I will now play each of the sounds you have just learned and pause to give you time to identify the sound. I will then give the name of the sound. Recorded at the second left intercostal space. Atrial septal defect. Recorded at the second right intercostal space. Ejection click due to a bicuspid aortic valve. Recorded at the apex. mitral valve prolapse. Recorded at the fourth left intercostal space. Hand grip. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Recorded at the fourth left intercostal space. Hand grip. Ventricular septal defect. Recorded at the fourth left intercostal space. Pericardial friction rub. Recorded at the fourth left intercostal space. Tricuspid regurgitation. If you did not recognize all of these sounds, you may want to listen to the program again. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this program. I hope you have found it to be both enjoyable and useful in your care of patients.